Uh, we are going to turn our attention now to a very, very important issue, the nuclear saber rattling going on in the Korean Peninsula and ongoing uh, at least possibility of intensifying conflict there uh, in North Asia. And we are very honored to be joined here once again on the show by Ju Hyun Park, who is a member of Notatal, and they are also the engagement editor at The Real News. Ju Hyun, thanks so much for being back with us. Oh, you might be muted. It has to happen at least once every episode. Oh, it has to happen at least once. Oh, maybe it's on I our think, end. Do we have to fix it from our end? Yeah, it might be from our end. All right, well, you know. We're going to work on this for a second. That. We'll come back to yeah. that. But no, no, I, I think the point you're making is uh, – very true about more members of Congress speaking out. I think Rashida Tlaib, you know, particularly important as a Palestinian, I mean, in a way it kind of reminds me of, you know, I don't know, people might take me to task for this, people like Adam Clayton Powell and others, early black representatives who were, you know, kind of the only person uh, and obviously more or less the sort of Jim Crow reality was going to go on, but by just having someone who could speak directly and boldly to the reality of racism, you know, in the public sphere had its own impact on sort of, you know, loosening up the atmosphere uh, and, you know, opening this, the way for even greater push by, you know, those on the ground and those who really matter at the end of the day, the masses of people to to make change on an issue. But I think it is important. And I thought, uh, you know, her referencing her grandmother, for instance, like that's kind of like, yeah, what, I mean, what can you say to that? We know what they'll say to that, but shameful really, uh, that this even happened, you know, Hakeem Jeffries, who, by the way, the head of the Democrats in Congress, once paraphrased George Wallace, the segregationist, since we're talking about segregation, so uh, and oh. a supportive of Israel, really amazing. Oh, I think we have Ju Hyun back with us now. Ju Hyun. Hey, can you hear can me? Hear yes. Yes. All right. Yes. Okay, great. fantastic. Perfect, perfect, Let's perfect. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And, you know, even though it's been a little bit overshadowed now by some other news out of the peninsula we can get to, uh, what I would consider very significant, the U.S. bringing a nuclear-armed submarine to uh, the Republic of Korea, I think, for the very first time. I mean, talk about why that's in, important, because I think we've become so desensitized to hearing anything about, you know, nuclear weapons and nuclear war in this country. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you once again for having me on. It's really great to be here with you two again. Um, yeah, so on Tuesday, a nuclear submarine, the USS Kentucky, arrived in the port of Busan in South Korea. Uh, this is the first time a nuclear submarine has been deployed to Korea from the United States since 1981. So the first time in over 40 years. Now, this is a submarine that's capable of carrying up to 20 nuclear ballistic missiles, although it isn't carrying them presently. And it's an outcome of the Washington Declaration earlier this year between uh, Yoon and Biden that happened during President Yoon of South Korea's visit to Washington, D.C. Now, the broader context for this is an arms race, a tit-for-tat uh, weapons testing situation that people are probably familiar with in a bit of a shallow sense, but has really been intensifying for the last couple of years especially. Now, in the U.S., there's not so much widespread coverage on North Korea's military capabilities. Uh, the discussion is mostly framed around, you know, like, here go those crazy Koreans again, right? But we actually need to have some understanding of how the military capabilities of the DPRK or North Korea have been advancing and what that has to do with Washington's current posture. In the last couple of years, North Korea has tested hypersonic missiles. Very recently, they showed off solid fuel ballistic weapons and also demonstrated capabilities to fire missiles from mobile platforms. All of this actually does affect the real balance of power because it makes North Korea much more capable of fending off a U.S. attack and also breaking through U.S. defenses around its assets in Korea and in the larger Pacific region. So what the U.S. is doing right now is baring its teeth. What's the point of sending a nuclear submarine to Korea right now? Biden and Yoon have actually been very upfront about it. In their language, they want to flex U.S. power to show the DPRK that the United States can, quote unquote, end the regime. And so it's important to understand that this is an escalation. This is a threat. It's true that the United States doesn't technically need a nuclear sub to, to physically be in Korea 
in order to launch a nuclear strike. But the point is more about demonstrating that it's willing to devote these kinds of assets to Korea in the first place. South Korea has been part of the U.S. nuclear umbrella for decades, which means for a long time there's been an agreement for the U.S. to use nukes in Korea already. So the point of doing this now is for the U.S. to put its money where its mouth is to show that it's kind of serious about these commitments. But if you ask me what's really significant about this moment, besides demonstrating U.S. aggression, besides demonstrating that leaders in Washington are very flippant about the idea of nuclear war, that they treat this as something that is not you know, a planet ending possibility, but just as another option that's open to them uh, to preserve their power. What's really significant, I think, is that it shows that U.S. does not have a viable strategy in Korea. The only solution, the only path they can think of is to escalate, to bully, to threaten over and over, hoping that one day North Korea will just give up and back down. But the fact is that this has been going on for decades and the DPRK is not going to back down. (laughs) The only path ahead is for the U.S. to actually behave more and more barbarically, uh, which is only going to demonstrate more and more what its actual interests are, uh, its actual disregard for not only life and land in Korea, but the lives of pretty much everyone else on Earth. And this is especially dangerous right now because there are elements in South Korea, including the current president, who want to either develop their own nukes or have U.S. nukes stationed in South Korea once again. And I think that is a longer term outcome we should be aware of. But if the U.S. ever crosses that line, it will only show the world how irresponsible and reckless the United States really is when it comes to its nuclear arsenal. And I think the task that will be incumbent on us is asking, why does this country get to have so many nukes in the first place? Why do they get to set the rules of how everyone else uses their nukes? And what is a real solution towards a denuclearized and peaceful world that doesn't run through the denuclearization of the United States as well? That's a very, very good way to put it. And, you know, the U.S. and Japan and and South Korea and their response to this recent nuclear test in the DPRK said that they were, quote, open to negotiations. But, you know, the DPRK said that they were not interested in negotiations without some sort of unilateral steps by others. And then, of course, the Western media presents that as some sort of intransigence on the part of the North. So how do you see it? I see it as smart negotiating frankly. Uh, The nuclear situation in Korea didn't start yesterday. This is an issue that, depending on how you look at it, either goes back to the 1980s at the earliest and arguably all the way back to the Korean War. So from the North Korean perspective, they've tried the route of negotiations time and time again, and they've been disappointed. Now, North Korea has always been very clear about what it would want from denuclearization uh, talks, and that's a security guarantee, normalizing relations with the U.S., and more recently, either an end to or at least a partial retraction of sanctions. The U.S., on the other hand, has never been willing to do all that it would take to provide that. So after decades of trying, uh, last fall, the Supreme People's Assembly, which is sort of like the North Korean Congress, passed a law declaring that the DPRK is now a nuclear state officially, and they will never again negotiate with a foreign power about their nuclear weapons. And it's important to understand that that actually doesn't mean that North Korea is walking away from the table forever. They're setting a new bar for future negotiations. To put it in uh, popular therapy speak, North Korea is just setting boundaries, although these are much better boundaries than Jonah Hill's. Um, now, the ball is in the United States. And Sorry, I had to go there. Um, so, so the ball is now in the U.S. court. Right, The U.S. and its allies need to accept reality, which is that denuclearizing North Korea is no longer a possibility, but it is still possible to de-escalate from the present situation. Now, frankly, that will require the governments of South Korea and Japan to actually put their interests ahead of U.S. interests for once. But because as long as the United States keeps making threats keep, and also tries to gesture towards negotiations at the same time, it's going to only come across as hypocritical and empty because it is. And the DPRK will be right to disregard these gestures until there are demonstrations made that this time it's more serious. You know, the big news that has really overtaken everything is this at least alleged uh, defection by a U.S. soldier into uh, North Korea. And we obviously don't really know all that much about it now. But one of the things that a lot of people have been commenting on, I've seen online, that I'd be curious your thoughts about is how the U.S. military and government seem to be bending over backwards to avoid using the term 
defection. Like they feel like somehow mm -hmm. that uh, for whatever reason is is like you if you say that some new Pandora's box is open. But I wonder why you think that is. Well, I think they're a little embarrassed, and I, I frankly find the situation a little humorous, um, if I can be a little bit unprofessional maybe for a second. <laughs> you have this clear situation where a U.S. soldier ran across the DMZ with full awareness of everything that that would imply, and if eyewitness reports are to be believed, he allegedly was yelling, ha, 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 as he did it. Um, now we know that this soldier, Travis King, was actually in trouble with the U.S. military for a couple of assault charges against Korean civilians and was also allegedly on his way to being sent back to the U.S. to face further discipline after already spending a little time in South Korean prison. Now, this looks like a pretty obvious instance of defection on its face, but U.S. media just won't say that. Instead, they're focused on how the DPRK has detained, quote unquote, Travis King, um, as if, you know, Kim Jong-un personally like reached across the line and grabbed him and then kidnapped him instead of Travis King running uh, off to them of his own free will while allegedly cackling the whole time. Um, I actually saw a video of Nikki Haley trying to threaten Kim Jong-un over this. Uh, she said something to the effect of like, if you harm one hair on his head, it'll be the end of you. Um, and I think it's clear that the U.S. is doing everything it can to spin this as an evil North Korea story instead of a story of actually in discipline and dissatisfaction in its own military ranks, which is much more harmful uh, from a PR standpoint for the US. Now, there is also another dimension to this in that, you know, this term defector is very loaded in the Korean context because anyone who ever migrates from the DPRK for any reason is just automatically called a defector, regardless of whether or not they actually leave for political reasons. And there are several hundred thousand DPRK citizens who live in China, but most of them are there for economic reasons and not necessarily political ones. And there have been interviews conducted with some of these folks where many of them actually reject the term defector because it, they feel like it's not an accurate description of who they are. Um, there's also about 30,000 uh, migrants from the DPRK in South Korea who also get lumped into this category, even though for most of them, they actually ended up there again for primarily economic reasons. And a lot of them came under the impression that they could go home someday only to find out that wasn't true. I would really recommend for the audience here to look into the story of Kim Dong-hui, who is a uh, one of the more famous North Korean migrants who tried to go back home from South Korea and actually ended up under police investigation because of it. Now, coming back to Travis King for a second, it's hard to say, you know, how this story is going to end, but there are a couple final details I want to point out about that, his case, because if it becomes undeniable that this is, in fact, a defection, I would predict that media and U.S. officials are going to start picking apart his criminal record as a way to paint him as some kind of erratic outlier. You know, they're going to try and say like, oh, all our soldiers are happy. They don't behave this way. Uh, the alliance is strong, all these things. But the truth is, I would argue that Travis King is not that much of an outlier. He's been accused of assaulting a Korean civilian on one occasion and doing property damage to a police vehicle on another occasion. And this is reflective of an entitled mentality that's very common among U.S. soldiers in Korea because they are an occupying force. They don't respect Korean people, they don't respect Korean law, and they don't respect Korean land. And for a long, long time, U.S. soldiers were totally immune from prosecution under South Korean law. And that's only changed in the past few decades because the people of South Korea stood up and said no more. So any wrong that Travis King has done isn't a reflection on him alone. It's a reflection on the entire institution of the U.S. military and the nature of the U.S.-South Korea alliance, which is really more of a hostage situation. Now, the final wrinkle here that I would add is that Travis King is a black man and speaking entirely from conjecture, which I don't love to do, I don't really believe that he would have been uh, received equal treatment within the U.S. military itself. And I'm sure that there is much more to his story that we probably just can't know with the information we have and we won't know for a long time. But I'm certain that when it does come out, it will still, again, be much more of a reflection on the U.S. military as an institution than anything else. And in the meantime, I really don't expect him to be harmed while he's in North Korean custody because there is a history of U.S. soldiers defecting to North Korea, and there's a history of them being treated well and even permitted to go home eventually. So I have no reason to think that this case will be different, and I think that folks shouldn't, um, shouldn't allow imperialist media to make this about you know, the DPRK doing something bad when actually it's entirely about uh, faults and fractures that lie within the U.S. military itself.
Mm -hmm. Well, Ju Hyun, as always, really appreciate you joining us and helping to sort through all of these issues that aren't covered that well in the mainstream media. And just want to note again, you are a member of Note at All and the engagement editor at The Real News. Thanks so much for giving you giving us some of your time here in the Freedom Side. Thanks. Have a good one.